Good evening, Local 4 now bringing you special live coverage of Governor Gretchen Whitmer's first State of the State address. In just a moment, she will walk into the Capitol and address lawmakers and you, of course, the residents of Michigan. The governor expected to address the state's road problem, among other things, of course. Her first address comes just weeks, of course, after potholes caused the closure of a major freeway. Governor saying drivers have been forced to pay for repairs with money that they should be spending on things like rent or child care, groceries, on and on. Whitmer also expected to touch on infrastructure, water, and talk about job skills as well. So let's uh, set the scene for you. Take a look at uh, the evening as it's shaping up at the state capitol in Lansing. Uh, this, of course, was an address that was supposed to happen one week ago tonight, but because the president's State of the Union address got moved by a week due to the government shutdown, so too did the State of the State address. But uh, really her first chance uh, since winning the election back in November to address the citizens who elected her. And we've been keeping an eye on social media as well. A lot of folks taking guesses as to uh, the topics that she is going to focus on, the theme of her speech tonight, and also um, how long as well, <laughs> right? It's always, yes, yeah, always a good little parlor game as to how long someone will go. And we are uh, joined now by uh, Nolan Fenley, uh, editorial page editor of the Detroit News, and Chastity pratt Dossi of Bridge Magazine, both very familiar faces for uh, if you're a part of the Flashpoint family. Uh, Chastity, let me start with you. What do you think the, the, to the governor should should be uh, aiming to try to do tonight. Uh, very definitely talking about the roads, infrastructure, things like that. We know that for sure. And job skills. She said all that before. But people in Southeast Michigan want a larger message. Is she going to reach across the aisle? Is she going to have bipartisanship? She needs to do that with yeah. this legislature, especially. You know, Nolan, she, of course, got used to having to do everything in a bipartisan fashion mm -hmm. when she was the minority leader. Right. Pretty good training. But uh, does it work the same way then when you're on the other side of the, uh, of the arrangement? Well, I mean, it's the same challenge. I think she's got to keep it simple, though, tonight. Roads, roads, roads. That's what she promised on the campaign trail. Be time later on uh, for the getting to the other things on her checklist. But if she comes out with a strong proposal to deal with the roads, uh, this is the time of year to do it. Everybody's <laughs> out there and they're reminded of how bad things are. She comes out with a strong plan for roads. Nothing else much uh, will get any attention. So stick, stick to the uh, core issue. And we kind of, I think, have a good idea of what she will talk about. Any guesses as to what she may completely stay away from tonight? <laughs> what, what don't you touch on a night like tonight? Mm, I don't know about car insurance. That's, mm, yeah. that's a yeah. big one for especially Detroiters, but it's, it's in court, it's sticky, gerrymandering is stickery, mm -hmm. sticky. <laughs> stickery, <laughs> it is indeed stickery. <laughs> Let's, uh, she's just now entering uh, the uh, legislative chamber there. Let's uh, head back to the Capitol and watch her uh, making her way through the crowd. And as we watch her uh, approaching the podium here, uh, and Nolan, the other th if it was easy to pay for the roads, if it was an easy, mm. if there was something easy to be done, it had been done. So this is going to require some creativity in finding something that is uh, palatable to both sides. Well, yeah, the, the things we've been hearing leading up to this is that she was going to take the 6% that's a sales tax that's applied to fuel in Michigan and use that for the roads. Other states, it is used for the roads. Here, we use it for education. We use it for revenue sharing. It's about a billion dollars. If you take that away from those other pockets, if you will, You've got to fill this in some way. And I don't know where that's going to be because I don't think a Republican legislature is going to give her a tax hike. It's hard to imagine that happening, Chastity. You've got a number of people who've been elected on that exact promise that they wouldn't uh, ever vote for a tax increase. Whether it's roads, infrastructure, school funding, job sure, skills, sure. third grade reading, all of these things require money, and that is the question. Will that be something that she can get out of this legislature? More money. Yeah, tricky. And as we're looking live right now, we're seeing her walking up, shaking hands, a lot of hugs as she gets ready for the uh, her first state of the state address. We uh, did a poll recently at Local 4 uh, with the Glenn Gariff group that showed she has very low right now uh, negative ratings. Very few people in Michigan have a negative perception of her. but. We're in the honeymoon stage. She She's hasn't done had to do anything yet. tough. <laughs> Although, I know, Nolan, you've uh, taken some issue with the executive orders. I'm I, not sure you're fond of I think we've, I'm not fond of them, whether they're done at the state level, or the presidential mm -hmm. level, whether it's Republican or, or Democrat. There is regular order governing here, and you work through the legislature, and just because you've got a hostile legislation or legislator or uncomfortable,
um, uncooperative legislature doesn't mean you can go around. Well, I mean, they're part of our government, executive orders are, and, and, and executives use them. Uh, I think the bigger question is how many will stick, because <laughs> the, the legislature can override them. We're up to 10, I believe, right. uh, uh, so far in this uh, early tenure of uh, Gretchen Whitmer. But uh, no doubt an exciting moment for her. She spent a lot of time uh, sitting in this chamber listening to State of the State addresses before. And uh, this time it's uh, her turn to, uh, to deliver it. So let's listen in, and then at the end we'll bring uh, Nolan and Chastity back. We'll uh, not only uh, talk a little bit after the address here uh, on the broadcast side, but we'll also move over for a conversation. I'll click on Detroit.com, and there you see the new Lieutenant Governor, Garland Gilchrist, about to bring this uh, meeting to order. Convention and honor guests, I present to you the Governor of the State of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. I gotta turn it on. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It is a privilege to be addressing you tonight as the 49th governor of the great state of Michigan. I want that. To my partner, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, to Speaker Chatfield, to the Majority Leader, Shirky, and to the Democratic Leaders, Chris Gregg and Jim Ananick, I am honored to be here with you tonight. To the members of my cabinet over here in the corner, to my daughters, Sherry and Sydney, my husband, Mark, and to my fellow Michiganders, good evening. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak with you tonight about the growing challenges that we face here in Michigan, the steps we are going to take to address them, and my priorities for next year and beyond. Yes, get comfortable. <laughs> As you can imagine, over the past few weeks, I've gotten a lot of unsolicited input about what I should say tonight and what I should do as governor. Someone even suggested, after the recent record-breaking weather, that I should, quote, fix the damn weather. <laughs> I guess the cat's out of the bag and you now know my slogan for 2022. <laughs> Joking aside, I want to thank all of the dedicated public servants who showed up for work during dangerous conditions to keep the rest of us safe. I also want to express my deepest gratitude to the Michiganders who keep us safe every day, those who served in our armed forces, and the veterans who have risked their lives to serve the United States of America. One of those veterans and one of Michigan's greatest leaders was Congressman John Dingell, who passed away last week at the age of 92. From his courageous service in World War II to his model leadership over 59 years in the United States House of Representatives, Congressman Dingell devoted his life to serving the people of Michigan and he will forever be remembered as the Dean of Congress, but not simply for the length of his service, but for the crucial role he played in passing some of the most monumental laws of the past century. He was the epitome of what I think we in Michigan know. You don't have to be mean to be strong.
And those who live by this creed can get a lot of things done. So I want to extend my deepest and most heartfelt condolences to Congresswoman Debbie Dingell and the entire Dingell family for their loss. We are a grateful nation and a proud state for the work John Dingell did. welcome the public servants who are either new to state government or who are now serving in new roles, like Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Jocelyn, welcome. <laughs> Attorney General Dana Nessel. And all of the dedicated public servants of my cabinet, which, by the way, is the most diverse in Michigan history. And the new leader of our state's highest court is here tonight as well, Chief Justice Bridget Mary McCormick. For the first time in Michigan history, our governor, attorney general, secretary of state, and chief justice of the Supreme Court are all women. It's not to overlook our United States Senator or the fact that we sent five, a record five women to the United States Congress in this last year. I see you, Congresswoman. Finally, I want to congratulate the 52 members of the Michigan Legislature who are embarking on their first term in office. I remember vividly the excitement that I felt as a 29-year-old freshman lawmaker. I sat where you are in the House and eventually in the corner as the Senate does. <laughs> I watched three governors give the State of the State address. And back then, it never dawned on me for a second that I would stand here one day and deliver this speech. I am eager to work with each of you to get things done for the people of our state. Congratulations to all of you. And we must work together because we've got a lot to do. As I have said before, Michigan's problems are not partisan problems. Potholes are not political. And there is no such thing as Republican or Democratic school kids or drinking water. Our challenges affect us all. Our challenges affect us all, and they will require us all working together to solve. Despite our challenges, Michigan's greatest strength is and always has been our people. It is no accident that Michigans are, Michiganders are a diverse, persevering, innovative group. I mean, just think about the people who built this state. Dutch immigrants who settled in West Michigan to work the land. Finns who came to mine in the Upper Peninsula. African Americans who came north for jobs in the auto industry. People from the Middle East who made Dearborn one of the country's most vibrant, flourishing, Arab American communities. People from around the world came to Michigan for a good paying job, a high quality education for their kids, and the right to live and worship freely. The diverse people who built our state saw Michigan not just as a potential home, but as a home for opportunity. That is our legacy, and it is a great legacy. Michigan has been a home for opportunity for 182 years. 
and of course our predecessors overcame some big obstacles along the way. And now it is our turn to make sure that Michigan is a home for opportunity for people today and for future generations. There's no doubt there are some wonderful things happening in our state. There are also some very serious challenges. Today, Michigan is confronting two major crises. The first is our failing infrastructure, and you knew I was gonna talk about it. Last year, the American Society for Civil Engineers gave Michigan infrastructure an overall grade of D+. Our roads fared even worse with a D minus, with just 18% of Michigan roads in good condition. Another recent study found that Michigan was, had the worst roads in the country. The worst. Now let's be honest, none of us needs a study to tell us how bad our roads are. The evidence is impossible to ignore. Just a few weeks ago, I-75 was suddenly shut down in Oakland County because dangerous potholes flattened and destroyed tires, sidelining dozens of cars. But the potential consequences, of course, can be much more serious than just a flat tire. Right now, we have crumbling bridges that have hundreds of temporary supports holding them up. I want you to think about buses of kids and families traveling over those bridges or under them. Chunks of concrete slamming through windshields. By one estimate, the vehicle damage from our roads costs the average motorist $562 a year in repairs. And if you're a Detroiter, it's a lot more expensive. That is money that could go toward childcare rent, college tuition, or retirement savings. We are fixing our cars and paying a road tax that doesn't even fix the damn roads. So while it is hard to imagine that things could get worse, that's precisely what will happen if we don't act boldly and swiftly because over the next decade, the share of Michigan's highways and trunk lines in poor condition will more than double, worsening the severity of the danger and of course, costing drivers across our state even more. It endangers our families. It robs us of our time and our hard earned money. And it hurts businesses' bottom lines. It also jeopardizes our edge in mobility and limits our ability in terms of economic potential and investment. Because no one will invest in a state that doesn't invest in itself. That's the hard truth. And let's be very clear, incremental fund shifts, like we've seen in recent years, they just won't fix the problem. They only slow our decline. And I gotta tell you, I didn't run for governor to manage the decline of the state that I love. We deserve better and we must do better. I ran to make sure that this is a state where our kids stay and our families thrive. Solving this crisis will not be easy. We did not get here overnight. This is a challenge 30 years in the making, the result of underinvestment across multiple administrations. We need to act now, though, before a catastrophe happens or the situation becomes truly unrecoverable. And every one of us has a role to play. So to everyone at home who is tuning in, Share your stories about what the infrastructure crisis means to you. Take a picture of your damaged car or your repair bill or the pothole outside your house and post it with the hashtag 
FTDR, and I think you know what that stands for. <laughs> to Michigan businesses, quantify what the infrastructure problems mean to your bottom line and share it using the hashtag FTDR. And to my friends in the legislature, when you're back home in your districts, talk to your local leaders and start to prioritize so that we can make sure when we come back and we pass a budget, we get to work on the things that are most meaningful to the people that you represent. Let's get it done and let's fix the damn roads. Now, of course, you cannot navigate the road if you are looking at your phone. So in addition to better roads, we need safer roads. Car crashes are the number one killer of our young people. I recently met Steve Kiefer, who told me about his son, Mitchell, a 2016 graduate of Detroit Catholic Central, a member of the state championship hockey team. Mitchell was a freshman at Michigan State when he was tragically killed by a distracted driver on I-96. The family formed the Kiefer Foundation to carry on Mitchell's legacy and to end distracted driving. And they're already making important progress. I gotta tell you, all the hearings I sat through as a legislator, there was nothing that amazed me more than parents that could channel the loss of their child into a crusade to protect other people's kids. Today, we are joined by Mitchell's parents, Steve Kiefer and Paula Kiefer, up here in the gallery, and Mitchell's siblings. Those are Mitchell's siblings up there as well, Blake, Juliana, and Alexa. I know the Kiefer's and I believe it is time for Michigan to join the 16 states that have passed hands-free laws to keep our roads and our kids safe. So let's make it happen. We also face serious infrastructure problems with regard to our water. Last month, Flint's water showed the lowest levels of lead and copper contamination since the start of the crisis four years ago. That's good, but our work is not done. We are home to 21% of the world's fresh water, and yet too many families in Flint and across our state don't have access to clean drinking water talking about contamination from old pipes, but also PFAS, toxic chemicals that have been found in our lakes, our rivers, and our water systems in more than 70 communities across our state, spanning both peninsulas. This problem may not have commanded as much national attention as the crisis in Flint, but it is just as urgent. And it is time to step up our efforts to protect the health and safety of all Michiganders. <clears throat> From our roads to our water, infrastructure is the crisis that we see. We see it in our commutes. We see it in our communities and in our homes. But the second crisis is harder to see, but every one of us knows it exists. It is the crisis in education and skills. And just like infrastructure, it impacts every single one of us, our employers, our workers, and all of our kids. Today, third graders in Michigan rank in the bottom 10 in our country in literacy. 
the bottom 10. Since 2014, among states measured every year, Michigan has actually experienced the worst decline in childhood literacy. And the decline has been consistent across every racial and economic group in our state. And let's be very clear. This is not happening because our kids are less talented. This is not happening because our kids are less motivated. It's not happening because our educators are less dedicated. It's happening because generations of leadership have failed them. I know Republicans love education, don't you? In the past 25 years, Michigan has seen the lowest growth in K-12 education spending of any state in the country. And during that time, our per-pupil revenue has actually fallen by 15%. In the last decade, as our literacy crisis has grown, our predecessors have repeatedly raided the K-12 education fund to fill gaps elsewhere in the state budget. Despite these challenges, we still have some incredible people teaching across our state. People like Marla Williams, who is here tonight. She's right up there. Marla is a special ed teacher at Davison School in Detroit, where she is known as a tireless advocate for her students. In class, Marla ensures that her special ed students have all the same opportunities as their peers. But her work doesn't stop when the bell rings at the end of the day. She goes to their birthday parties. She visits them when they're sick. She even has taken some of their clothing home to launder it for them. She changes lives for the better every day. And that's because she, like so many Michigan educators, knows that teaching is more than a career, it's a calling. I want to send a message to all the devoted educators across Michigan. You're not failing us. We have been failing you. educators and our kids deserve our support, not a funding crisis that undermines the work of the classroom, that weakens our schools and compromises the education. We know that potential is everywhere. Potential is universal. But right now, opportunity is not. Our students are not broken. Our teachers are not broken. It's our system that has been broken. And while we can't fix it overnight, and greater investment alone won't be enough. We are going to do it because two million kids in Michigan are counting on us. Our education crisis compromises our workforce, and this is at a moment when the skills we need to compete for good paying jobs are rapidly changing. At the Detroit Auto Show last month, I met with auto executives who said their number one challenge was attracting talent. They used to need auto engineers. Today, they need software engineers and developers and more people from the trades. The skills gap poses a serious economic challenge for us. As part of the and part of the problem is that we have failed to prioritize talent and ensure that everyone has a real path to a high wage skill. 
because the vast majority of today's jobs require some form of post-secondary education, whether it's a degree or skills certification. But as of 2016, only 44% of our workforce has such a credential. And simply put, that's not good enough. It's not good enough to make Michigan competitive. And I don't accept that, and none of us should. As I've said, these challenges affect every one of us. They make Michigan a harder place to get ahead, a harder place to raise a family. They even make it tougher to run a business. And it's tougher to solve because of all the pressures on our state government that have been building up for years. Departments that are understaffed, that lack diversity, that suffer from low morale outdated technology and IT challenges that impede both state employees' ability to do their jobs and residents' ability to access their government. Severe budget constraints that have prevented badly needed investments in our roads and infrastructure and more. Over the last month, the Lieutenant Governor and I have visited every department in person. I've met with state employees who have served the public for 30, 40 years and never met a governor before. I listened and I learned about the obstacles they try to navigate on a daily basis to serve the people of our state. And I promised them I would do everything I can to support them. Because while many people focus on what happens here at the Capitol, the real work of state government, the real work of protecting our kids, protecting the public, working with business, is done by the 48,000 people of our state workforce, and they don't get the gratitude they deserve. Now there's a man here from the state workforce who I think exemplifies that. Eric Oswald is here with us today. Eric was a colonel in the Air Force and he retired in 2017. And he was looking for a new challenge when the Flint water crisis hit. So he stepped up. He stepped up to serve his state again, this time as the DEQ's Director of Drinking Water and Municipal Assistance Division. Eric says he sees the same qualities in his fellow state employees that he saw in the military. Hard working public servants committed to the mission of protecting and serving others. They deserve our thanks and support and I am proud to be in their ranks. Now the challenges that I've laid out tonight are not the fault of any one politician or any one political party. I spent 14 years in the legislature, so I know how tough it is to keep the government funded and functioning. But I also know this, turning a blind eye or passing phony fixes won't solve problems. In fact, they make it harder. Filling potholes instead of rebuilding roads pretending that little increases can fix an education crisis like we have, playing a shell game with the state budget, ignoring the potential of hundreds of millions of dollars in lawsuits from the last administration, giving sweetheart deals to political insiders, or spending $1.3 billion on the last day of lame duck session in December. A government that does not work today can't get the job done for tomorrow, and that ends now. <laughs> 
As a state, we must make the bold choices so we can build a stronger Michigan, and we need to do it together. I recognize that the tone starts at the top, and that's why I took a number of steps during my first month in office to make sure that government works. So our state employees and our businesses and our employees across the state and people can trust us. My first act was an executive order, executive directive, so that state employees know how and are empowered to alert us of imminent threats to the public health, safety, and welfare. Valid concerns about public health and welfare will be acted upon. I also established stronger ethics rules for the executive branch, including a ban on the use of private email accounts to conduct state business. For too long, our government has been plagued by a lack of transparency, and we have consistently ranked the worst in the country. We in this room have the power to fix that. Let's expand FOIA to my office and to yours. It is time to ensure that the sun shines equally on every branch of state government. I also signed an executive directive banning state government from discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. without exception. Now Michigan government is on the right side of history because no one should get fired because of who they are or who they love. And it'll help me build and attract a talented, top-notch workforce in state government. And that's precisely why the business community has pushed to extend these rights to the private sector as well. If we want Michigan to be a home for opportunity, it should be opportunity for all in all workplaces. We need to expand Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act to include protections for the LGBTQ community. And I want to make sure that women have opportunity too. Today, women in Michigan's workforce make 78 cents for every dollar men make for doing the same job. And women of color make even less. It is time for that to change. And that's why I signed an executive directive prohibiting employers in state government from asking women about their salary histories. You might wonder why that makes such a big difference, and it's because if you can't ask that question, past discrimination won't hurt a woman's future earnings. But I want you to I want you to hear a couple of statistics. If we extended these same protections to all Michigan women, we would cut the poverty rate among working women in half.
It would cut the poverty rate among working single moms by even more, pulling children out of poverty in our state. A Michigan woman's annual income would increase enough to pay for, on average, nearly 14 months of rent or 18 months of child care. That's how you build a stronger economy. That's making Michigan a home for opportunity. Now, opportunity also means a level playing field for small businesses. Small businesses from Marquette to Macomb to Muskegon Heights. And so I've opened up contracting opportunities for small businesses in designated opportunity zones across our state. That means that a small business in a geographically disadvantaged community will now have a level playing field. Let's keep Michigan dollars in Michigan. Let's create more opportunities for companies like Open Systems Technologies in Grand Rapids. I recently was in Grand Rapids and met with the CEO, Meredith Bronk, who's also with us tonight. Uh, she and several other women small business owners, we sat down and talked about how do we level the playing field for entrepreneurs across our state. And when we were in Grand Rapids, we were joined by former Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly or, as some of the newer legislators might know him, Mr. Julie Kelly. <laughs> but as the leader of the Small Business Association of Michigan, he's offered incredible support, and I'm grateful. And it is proof that if we can put the election behind us, we have a great opportunity to work together and to build a stronger economy. A stronger economy also requires a concentration of talent. And as I said earlier, we must ensure that every Michigander has opportunity through a path to skills that lead to a good job. Today's jobs and jobs on the horizon demand greater education and training than ever before. Right now, Michigan is one of only nine states in the country and the only state in the Midwest that has not even established a formal goal for post-secondary post attainment. That changes tonight. Yes. I'm announcing a new statewide goal of increasing the number of Michiganders between the ages of 16 and 64 with a post-secondary credential to 60% by 2030. And when you're at 44%, it is aggressive, but it is doable because great expectations lead to great results. To get there, though, we got to start thinking differently about what it takes to succeed. We used to think about careers in terms of ladders. There was one way up. But today, it's more like rock climbing. There are many paths to a good life. And we need to help people find the one that is right for them. That's why tonight I am announcing three paths to skills for workers and students across our state. The first is for Michiganders who have already started their careers. As workplaces evolve, many people will need to acquire new skills to advance or just to even keep the jobs they have. There are also displaced workers across our state who are looking for new opportunities. That's why we are launching the Michigan ReConnect by training adults seeking an in-demand industry certificate or associate's degree 
reconnect is a path for working Michiganders to upskill. It's also going to connect Michigan businesses to qualified candidates for the growing number of jobs that are currently unfilled. This initiative is modeled after one in Tennessee that their former governor, Bill Haslam, Republican, launched last year. And it is already surpassing expectations. Why can't we do that in Michigan? We can. Let's get it done. The second path is for graduating high school students who want to continue their education, but who decide that a four-year college or university just isn't for them. A four-year degree is not for everyone, but every one of us needs skills to get into a good job. So for them, the, the My Opportunity Scholarship will guarantee two years of debt-free community college for all graduating high school students who qualify. The scholarship will be officially launched this spring and available to students beginning the fall of 2020. And it will make Michigan the first Midwestern state to guarantee community college for all. The third path is for graduating high school seniors who, as my friends in the trades would say, are just not skilled trades material. I'm talking about people going to four-year university. <laughs> A study last year found that average cost of tuition, fees, room and board at a public four-year school in Michigan is almost $22,000 a year. That is the 10th highest in the nation and it is a complete barrier for a lot of people in our state. That's why the My Opportunity Scholarship will provide two years of tuition assistance at a four-year not-for-profit college or university for students who graduate from a Michigan high school with at least a B average. Real paths, real opportunity. Together, these three paths will go a long way toward closing the skills gap making Michigan's economy more competitive, and creating real opportunity for everyone in this state. If you are willing to put in the work, you're gonna have a path to succeed in Michigan. A strong Michigan requires more than just a singular commitment to better skills, though. It also requires a commitment to the health of our workers, families, and communities. And that is why we are taking several important steps to protect and improve public health. Last week, I announced the creation of a new department that will bring sharper focus to addressing Michigan's water safety and environmental challenges. The streamlined Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy will be tasked with ensuring that every Michigander has access to clean, safe drinking water. It will be charged with safeguarding our Great Lakes, taking action to protect our state from the harmful effects of climate change. The agency will include new offices of the Clean Water Public Advocate and the Environmental Justice Public Advocate. We are going to make state government more efficient and responsive to our environmental and public health challenges. The new department, Eagle, has gotten bipartisan support from Michigan businesses and leaders, including people like my friend Candace Miller over there, who's with us tonight.
as well as the former DEQ uh, director under the Snyder administration, Heidi Grother, and Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. I also joined Michigan in the U.S. Climate Alliance with a bipartisan coalition of governors from 20 different states that have committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Two weeks ago, we had wind chills 50 below zero. Last week, it was 50 above. And you know what it's like out there today. 100 degree swing in five days. And a reminder that climate change and extreme weather are already putting Michiganders at risk. As a state, we must take this seriously. We cannot and will not wait to act. Everyone in my administration is also committed to ensuring that all Michiganders have access to the quality health care they can afford. During my time in the State Senate, I worked across the aisle with Governor Snyder and Leader Shirky and Leader Ananick to expand Medicaid and provide coverage to 680,000 people in our state through Healthy Michigan. As governor, I am committed to defending Healthy Michigan, and we are already doing so in two important ways. First. Last week, I sent a letter to the Trump administration about my concerns that new work requirements slated for next year may hurt Michiganders. I wrote that I intend to work with the legislature to find ways that both promote work and preserve coverage for people who need it. Second, we have joined 19 other states to defend the Affordable Care Act in court. Hundreds of thousands of Michiganders' health care is on the line, and I want to commend the Attorney General for leading on that vital issue. The policies that I have outlined tonight will strengthen Michigan's foundation for our economic future. Next month, I will present a budget, and my budget will offer a real solution for fixing our roads and rebuilding our infrastructure. It will give frontline educators the tools they need to address the literacy crisis. And most of all, it will reflect my unwavering commitment to making Michigan the home for opportunity. The people of Michigan voted for people they believed could solve problems. There are legislative districts in our state that I won by double digits and voters also elected Republicans to represent them. Let's prove to them, let's prove to the country that divided government doesn't have to mean gridlock. I am eager to engage with any and all people of good faith about ideas and priorities, including your ideas on bringing down car insurance rates. I got these guys on their feet. <laughs> but I want to be very clear as we talk about where we are headed. I'm committed to this state and to solving problems. But I want you to know I'm going to reject anything presented as a solution that doesn't actually solve the problem or creates a new one. I will not sign anything that resembles the budget gimmicks and band-aids that have failed us in the past. I'm going to veto bills designed, sorry, I'm going to veto bills designed 
to cut out the public's right of referendum. And I will stay faithful to the mission of fixing the roads, improving skills through better education and training, and cleaning up our water. And I'll work with everyone who wants to do that. And one more thing I pledge to continue. I pledge to continue the culture that was created by the last administration. And I give kudos to Governor Snyder. Budgets got done before a break happened. We are going to stick to that. How many of you agree with me? No break until the budget's done. Because just like every other workplace, we shouldn't go on vacation until our job is done. You know, we can get a lot done in the legislature. We can get a lot done for the people of our state if we really focus on the things that matter. Some will doubt our ability to find common ground. Some will doubt our ability to make bold choices that are needed to ensure that Michigan will always be a home for opportunity. And when you look at the dysfunction in Washington, you understand the skepticism. Extreme partisanship, shutdowns and trade wars all put our economy at risk. And those things are out of our control. So let us stay focused on what we can control. Let us strive to see the humanity in one another along the way. Because when we do, it's a lot easier to find common ground. You all may know that I am centered by my family and my love for this state. And I hope my kids choose to make their lives here in Michigan. Garland Gilchrist is an engineer who moved back to Detroit with his wife, Ellen, to build a life for themselves and their twins, Garland and Emily, and a new member on the way in June. and Stephanie Chatfield are parents to five kids, eight years old and under, four sons and a daughter. And the speaker, like I used to, lives next door to his parents, and he is guided by his faith. Jim and Andrea Ananek expanded their family through adoption a few years ago. And like a lot of Flint families, they were worried about mixing baby Jake's formula. Jim's a teacher, and he has affinity for giving people nicknames. And if you're nice to me, I might tell you what he gave me a while ago. <laughs> As dads of young kids, I bet these three could get some pointers from the other two leaders. Mike Shirky has 12 grandchildren. He is rarely spotted around town after hours because he likes to hightail it home to Jackson to have dinner with his wife, Sue. And Chris Gregg has three sons. She loves tennis. And when she gets home, she's got this phenomenal spouse, Chef Bob, who's got something amazing waiting for her. We all have families. We all care about our kids and our grandkids' futures. We all want what's best for our communities and our state. And it is important for us to remember the enemy is not the person across the aisle. 
The enemy is apathy. The enemy is extreme partisanship. The enemy is self-interest. When we stand together as Michiganders, or Michiganians if you insist, <laughs> we can get the job done for the people of our state. We can build bridges and ensure that Michigan is the home for opportunity for generations to come. After my inauguration, I received messages of support and encouragement from people across our state. One of them was the granddaughter of Soapy Williams, Governor G. Menon Williams. A former labor leader sent me a Soapy Williams era bow tie, green with white polka dots, and a commemorative coin from the opening of the Mackinac Bridge. And holding the coin between my hands, it's a moving experience because when you read the inscription on this coin, it says, built by the will of a great people, Upon the, found, upon the foundations of Michigan's faith in her future. More than 60 years later, we are still a great people. We still have the will. We still have faith. The question is, do we have the wisdom to put partisanship aside and get the job done for the people we serve? I think we do. So let's get to work. Thank you. There you have it, the first State of the State address from the new governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer.